So if you can turn to page uh, five in your packet. All right, we're going to um, continue with um, solving differential equations, but uh, this today is more um, is more word problem solving. Uh, but in a sense, there's less calculus. It's just a bunch of uh, solving for missing um, variables. So, uh, so I, I don't think I have uh, much trouble with this today. Uh, one second. There's a little bit, uh, but um, a lot of it is just uh, we're just fine missing variables. And once we have that, we have our answer. So. Uh, all right, so uh, we can copy this down here. If I have a direct proportion equation, uh, that is going to be in the form of y equals kx, where y and x are related directly. So if y is increasing, x is also increasing. And uh, but if I have an inverse proportion equation, then it's y equals k over x. So that means if y is increasing, x is decreasing, and they have an inverse relationship, that k is the constant of proportionality. It connects uh, the relationship uh, between x and y. So number one, if the rate of change of y varies directly with the value of y, find the general equation. So, uh, oh, by the way, uh, with these word problems, everything is going to be in relation to time. So uh, t is going to be our independent variable. Okay? Everything is in relation to time. So if the rate of change of y, so we can think of that as y prime, rate of change of y, is that a derivative? It varies directly. So if it's a, a direct variation, direct proportion equation, it's going to be in, in that form. So y prime is equal to k times the value of y. So directly with y. So y prime equals ky. So that's going to be our relationship there. Direct proportion. So we know that it's not going to be uh, two variables above each other on the other side. They're both going to be in the numerator. So y prime equals ky. It says find the general equation. We can think of a y prime as dy over dt. And then a y, we can put that over one. So before I would say, oh, let's group all the y's to the left and then let's group all the x's to the right. Uh, here, we're going to treat time as the independent variable. So now anything uh, that is y is, will be still on the left, but everything that is uh, Basically, everything else is going to be on the right side. Okay. I'm going to cross multiply just like how we did yesterday. Now, K is just a constant. K is like a, imagine K as like a three or a five or a six. And we talked about yesterday how if something doesn't have to be on the left side, we want to put it on the right side. So uh, I like to cross multiply first because that gets my, uh, variables locked in. I'm, I want my dy and dt in the numerator in their right places because I don't want them to, to move. I, I want to get those sets and then I can decide what else needs to move around it to get full separation of variables. Okay, so at this stage, uh, our dy and dt are set, but do we have full separation of variables? No. What's out of place? The y. So how do we move it? Divide. Okay, where's, where's going to end up? Left side where? Denominator. Okay, so it's okay to have variable in the denominator. Sometimes I see students they move it, they move that variable in the denominator. And they feel wait, it feels out of place, so they make they make it go up to the numerator. They make it y dy, which in some problems that could be the case, but algebraically you'll be that that wouldn't be correct, right? We don't we don't want to just move that y up to the top, and uh, because then we're changing the problem. So um, so we have dy over y is equal to k. DT. Okay. We can now involve a definite integral or indefinite integral. 
if you want to write it this way, you can write it this way. You can say it's one over y dy is equal to the k is just the coefficient. It doesn't really impact anything. It's really one dt that's getting um, the integral process. So one over y dy, what rule do we use there? Natural log, yep. One over u du is natural log. So natural log absolute value of u in this case is y. Now, k is not a variable. We can't say, oh, that's k squared over 2. k is just some constant. It's really the 1 that's getting impacted. What's the antiderivative of 1? Or 1 dt? T. Good, because t is our variable. So 1 rises up to degree 1. We don't want to say x because that dt indicates that it's time is the variable that is on this side. So 1 becomes t. So t, sorry. K is a coefficient, so K needs to stay. So KT plus C. Any questions so far? Right, so now we have everything at the function level. The only thing left to do is to solve for Y. To solve for Y, we want to undo the natural log. So what can we do to both sides that can allow that natural log to disappear? Exponentiate. Okay, so we're going to raise both sides with E as the base. E raised to the natural log. This cancels out because natural log is base E, log base E. E and natural log, they're going to go away. I'm going to just be left with absolute value of Y. And then we can split this up, right? E to the KT plus C can be written as, we can apply this property, A to the M plus N can be expanded into A to the M times a to the kt. So e to the kt, what? Times e to the c. And what do you know about e to the c? The c, I can drop the absolute value. The plus or minus will show up on the right side, but then uh, it'll just get absorbed into that c. So y is equal to c e to the kt. This is going to be our equation most of the time. Whenever you see y prime equals ky, you no longer have to go through all this process because you know this is going to end up like this. So if it's r prime equals kr or p prime equals kp or s prime equals ks, you can just jump directly to this equation and you don't have to go through this whole process. So our word problems that we're going to see it's basically just working with this equation. We're going to solve for C, we're going to solve for K, and then we can make um, a further um, prediction as to population growth or population value or um, uh, the amount of radium left uh, after you know half-life. So we're going to, we're basically just working with an equation and just finding a bunch of uh, missing variables. So a lot of what we do today is we're, we're not doing much with calculus because we've already gone through the calculus from here to here, and we're just working with this equation basically to just solve for missing values. Okay, so number two, it says the rate of increase of population, so that's, where, that's basically P prime, is proportional. When it says proportional, the understood word is directly proportional. So if they want inverse proportion, they'll have to say the word inverse but if it's just say proportional, it's understood as direct proportion. So we want in this form of y equals kx is uh, directional uh, proportional to the population. So p prime is equal to kp. And is this in the same relationship as before? Yeah. Yes. So we can we can just jump past the cal the calculus portion and say, well, I'm I know I'm going to end up with p is equal to ce to the kt. I don't want to go through that whole process if I already know what my end result is going to be. Okay, so here's my equation that I'll be working with. We're going to gather a bunch of order pairs. Let me read the problem here. If the population in 1930 was 50,000, and then in 1960 was 75,000, what's the expected population in 1990? So I'm going to create a bunch of order pairs in this way here. Um, time is our independent variable. So time is our quote unquote x. And then population is our y variable. So population is kind of like our y variable, our y value. So t comma p. 
instead of x, y, we're going to say t comma p. We're going to find the earliest instance of that, uh, the earliest year, and we're going to call that year zero. That way we can take advantage of zero. We can, um, and then uh, we can adjust the, the, the year after we get our answer. So we'll let zero, let year zero be what? Like that, that's the earliest year we see, right? So uh, we'll let 1930 be t equals zero. So that means in 1930, year zero, what's our population? 3,000. So I'm going to create a bunch of order pairs here. In 1960, how many years after? 30. 30. So 30 years later. My population rises to 75,000. What's the expected population in 1990? What year? That's 60. Yeah, so year 60, we're going to be looking for some population. So we're going to gather information one at a time. The reason that we need three order pairs is one order pair will help us solve for C, the second order pair will help us solve for K, and once we have a um, uh, a rule in place, a formula in place, we can use this to predict the population um, in this in any year. In this case, it'll be in 1990, which is 60 years after 1930. So I'm going to plug a 0, 50,000 in for my original equation. So 0 goes in for T, 50,000 goes in for P. Let's see what we get. So I'm just replacing T with zero and P with 50,000. OK, let's see if we can find one of these missing variables here. What's E to the K time? Well, K times zero is zero. What's E to the zero? One. So my C is just 50,000. So I have that. I'm going to update my equation. And now I'm going to continue with my second order pair. And uh, this should help us solve for K. We'll insert 30 in for T, insert 75,000 in for P. And then you may need your calculator here. If not, I can just work the problem for us. Very good with the substitution made so far. Now, I want to solve for k. I'm going to uh, piece by piece move things away from that e to the k 30. So I'll divide both sides by 50,000. I'll get 1.5. Next up, I want to solve for K. K is stuck in the exponent. We know we have an easier time with bringing down exponents if it's part of a natural log expression. So I'm going to make both sides natural log. Now that exponent is free to come down. What's the natural log of E? Just one. So that goes away nicely. So I can solve for K, divide both sides by 30. Now, you may be tempted to want to insert this and get a decimal value, but we want to hold on to our exact value as far as we can, because if we do decimal versions at this stage in the middle of the problem, it's going to make it make our final answer even uh, further off. So. In the end, we're, we are going to make a decimal approximation, but we don't want to do a decimal approximation in the middle of the problem. So we want to hold on to this value um, because this at least will make our final answer a bit more accurate. All right, we have our C value. We have our K value. We can now update our equation with our C and our K replaced.
So P is equal to C E to the K times T. And now we can make uh, we can use this to predict our final answer here. We can now insert 60 in for T. And figure out what's our what's the pop expected population. 60 years after 1930, which is 1990. And this is just entering in the calculator. Okay, that's basically it. Uh, there's really not much to this um, section here. We're just working with y equals c to the kt. We're taking a bunch of order pairs, solving for c, solving for k, and then using our uh, final um, uh, <laughs> formula to make our final approximation. So we'll do two more of these examples, and then we'll probably go back and just do more practice with yesterday's topic with uh, solving differential equations. That's going to be where um, the bulk of our problems are that's going to be uh, where the, the more important uh, problems are going to be so but any questions so far all right page six let's try this one all right so i'll talk through the setup and then you guys can finish off the rest of the problem uh the rate of decay of radium so i'll call that r prime it's just some rate of change is proportional to the amount of radium at any time. So R prime equals KR, same relationship as Y prime equals KY, same relationship as P prime equals KP. We know that we're starting off with the same equation as before. Okay. Let me set up using order pairs and then have you guys finish off the rest. So uh, if 60 milligrams of radium are present now, Half-life is 1,690 years. How much radium will be present 100 years from now? So I'm going to set up a bunch of order pairs here. Uh, time T is my independent variable. Radium is my Y, my dependent variable. I'll use present day as year zero. So present day, 60 milligrams of radium. How much radium in 1,690 years? 30. Half life, yeah. So 30 remains, 30 milligrams remain. And then how much mil, how much radium will be present 100 years from now? Okay. So you use that 0, 060. This will help you solve for C, <coughs> update the equation, use a second order pair, plug in, solve for K, update the equation, and then finally plug in 100 to make your final answer. Okay, try that.
Now we see that with these problems, basically that C represents your initial amount, right? So, uh, so once you we recognize that, oh, um, whatever is at the beginning of the problem, that's going to be my C value. So anytime I see 0, 060 or 0, 030, um, I could, I know that that whatever my starting amount is, that's my C value. Let's do one more example. And we can go back to yesterday's topic. OK, uh, table four. Anybody still need this? Okay, very good. All right. In a certain culture where the rate of growth of bacteria is proportional to the amount present. So again, same relationship. B prime is equal to K times B. So it's going to end up being B is equal to C e to the K T. Uh, the number of bacteria is going to triple in three hours. Okay? If at the end of 12 hours, there were 10 million bacteria, how many were present initially? So we're kind of working backwards here. Usually we're given our initial amount, and then we're asking about, you know, at a certain hour after the initial. But here, uh, our C value, our initial value, will be the last thing that we find. Right. But I'm going to set up everything in in the order pair, just like before. So time in terms of hours, and then the number of bacteria present. So I know that at time zero, it's going to be some unknown initial amount. So I'm going to call it C. That's going to be my end result. Usually we start with this value. This problem, we're going to end with this value. Um, the number is going to triple in three hours. So I know that three hours later, what's going to happen to this C? 3C? And then 12 hours later, there's going to be 10 million. So I'm going to put 10. And I just remind myself that at the end, whatever number, whatever answer I get, I'll multiply that by a million. Okay, that way I don't enter in such large numbers in the calculator until the end. Okay, everybody good here? So before we were, we'll be given these numbers, and we're trying to then we'll ask to to uh, estimate how many after twelve hours, right? But in this case, we have um, order pairs. Um, given to us and we're working backwards to solve for C. So I really can't start here, right? If I plug Z, if I plug zero and C in, I'm not going to make any progress. So I'm going to move on to my second order pair. So I insert three in for time and I'll insert three C in for B. What's going to conveniently go away for us here? Okay. See, so that's nice. I can just focus on solving for K. So I want to solve for K. K is stuck in the exponent location. I'll take the Nash log of both sides to allow that K to come down. Make the substitution into my equation. So I'm going to move on to my third order pair. And hopefully this will help me solve for C. It should, because my K has been resolved. I'll plug 12 in for time. I'll plug 10 in for B. 
And that should allow me to isolate C and solve for C. This is just one big number, right? Well, it's just some number. E to the natural log of three times 12, whatever that number is, we divide it over to the other side to solve for C. Now, we have to make sure we multiply this by what? Because we represent a 10 as 10 million, so our true number. So somewhere in that range, somewhere in that 123,000, depending on how far you went in your decimal. All right, let's not worry about part B. Um, we're able to solve for C, that's what I wanted to, to do. Okay, not much to this, to this section here. Any questions? What's more important is being really comfortable with solving uh, differential equations. So uh, let's do a whole bunch of that today in class. Uh, let's go to page uh, 19. And let's just begin working through our process. So we're gonna start off our problems the same way, right? Cross multiply. <laughs> Cross multiplying does not guarantee separation of variables, but it will get your dx and dy's locked in. And then we can begin to decide, okay, how can we get the x's together, the y's together? I do have keys attached two pages later, so you can definitely check your progress. Let's just see how much we can do. And again, I really want to point out, um, you may be solving your C value at a different point than me in my key, which is fine. That just means that your C value may be different halfway through the problem, but in the end, our answer should still agree.
Right? If you're taking the odd root of an equation, of both sides of an equation, there's no plus or minus. So we only do plus or minus if it's an even root, like square root or fourth root. But if it's an odd root, there's no plus or minus. All right, any questions? All right, go on to number two. Uh, maybe for number two, you may want to cross multiply first and then replace that y prime with dy over dx. That way you're not going to deal with a what looks like a complex fraction. And then cross multiply from from here. Again, the parentheses are there to help us. We usually don't want to distribute through. Wrong page You're pretty good up to this point here. We should be looking at natural log on the left side and the right side should just be power rule. After this step. Now, as you're separating your um, right side into A to the, it looks like A to the A plus B plus C, but we are we want to selectively uh, separate our constant away from our variable expression. So I'm going to keep the 18x minus 3x squared together. I just want to have that C away uh, from the rest of the expression. So I'm going to let the 18x minus 3x squared stay together, and then the rest of it times E to the C. I want to purposely separate that constant away from my variable. Once you have your general equation, then you can move on to uh, the order pair and let that order pair help update your C value.
Answer choice E. Page 20, number All right, does anybody still need to look at number two? At the very end, I do end up with a plus or minus. But the only way that I can plug in a negative three and get a six in return is if I have a positive square root. So I'm looking, I'm looking at my y value. Whatever the sign of my y value is, is a sign of my square root. Okay, your calendar. Uh, I didn't follow the the uh, calendar before, but uh, for Friday, I'll have you guys uh, do one through four under seven point one and seven point two AP. If you swapped it and you did that in, in, instead of say page sixteen seventeen, then I'm gonna have I'm gonna have you show me those two pages in addition to seven point two. But for the rest of us, uh, it'll just be these problems not due tomorrow, but due on Friday. Okay, tomorrow is your test. And uh, we're just following uh, whatever uh, for tomorrow's test. Just study that review sheet, right? We did a derivative graph. 
We did Riemann sums. We did a particle motion. It'll just be one of each problem. Um, if you know how to do your practice, if you know how to do your review sheet, you should do really well on the test. Okay. Uh, help session tomorrow. I'll be. Uh, I'll go over uh, the rest of the packet for any ones uh, for any people who want to see me do uh, the other problems that we haven't done in class. Uh, that'll be seven thirty in the morning tomorrow. Okay. All right. Come get your phones. Okay, so Thank you. 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 Thank you.